Hi everyone, welcome to the Superhuman Switch podcast. I'll be talking with startup founders, business owners, and corporate executives who are striving to maintain healthy lifestyle. Today I have a special guest, uh, an inspiration story from basically uh, an active man who broke his back in 2009. However, in 2012, he became the Paralympic cyclist gold medalist, which is an amazing story and an example of resilient mindsets, grit, and of course, accepting the change in life. So welcome, welcome, Mark. How are you, my I'm friend? I'm super excited to have you here. My pleasure, my pleasure. Yeah. So, uh, Mark, uh, I'll start with the, with the quick story how, how I met you here in Dubai. It's, it, it was actually, I was having a coffee in, uh, in, in al Quz in Dubai, and uh, I was just concentrating on my screen, and you passed by like, okay, uh, he just leaned forward and asked me that, if you don't mind, can I sit on this big table because you have the power source here? And I said, oh yeah, of course, please have a seat. Then a few minutes later, there's another guy. I remember his name was Shane. And uh, also he asked that, uh, do you mind guys just, I can share the table with you? I said, oh, of course. Five minutes went by and said, okay, let me have a quick intro because guys, I don't like to sit on a table that we don't know each other. Yes. So I introduced introduce myself. And then of course you, you mentioned that uh, basically your background and Shane, the same thing. And we spent some time like talking about what we're doing and you showed me your website about the rice 365 it was really amazing but what the surprise was <laughs> when you <laughs> when you told me just to research your name and you know when when you put the name and you have this kind of google recommendations and then you realize that you have the 10 pages of google <laughs> only mark call it mark, mark 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 it was it was a uh, humbling basically uh, knowing the story and I was lucky enough to also to be invited for the talk after like two weeks, which is uh, basically uh, it was it was inspirational. You shared the whole story and uh, I became knowing you even more. And uh, thank you for being here. So it's a pleasure. I think I think we discussed this and it's, for me, it's a very good opportunity to speak with people like you and to give basically the value back to to others. Yes. Well, I think the first thing I want to say is obviously thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for reaching out on that wonderful table in Alcoz, <laughs> you know, when uh, you had this huge table to yourself and I was struggling to do my work on the sofa. Yeah. And uh, I remember saying to you, you know, do, do you mind if I join you, you know, and uh, just your wonderful humility, you know, was welcoming, you know, it really was welcoming. And, uh, and yes, you know, when, when you sort of said, well, hi guys, you know, we, we're neighbors for the next maybe one hour. <laughs> we may as well introduce ourselves. That's true. I, I knew at that point that I was in good company, you know, and my late father always used to say that you're known by the company you keep. And it's very true. That's very true, which has obviously brought us to today, you know, to your wonderful home. Thank you. And I appreciate you welcoming me in to this, uh, this exciting podcast, you know, and uh, just to say, you know, hello. Good evening, good morning, good night to your <laughs> listeners, you know, wherever they are in the world. Amazing. So let, let's dive in. Uh, again, as I mentioned, you have really an inspiring story and, and we can we have a lot to cover. Uh, but of course, we can we can highlight the things that we already discussed some of them. But I would really interested to share with the audience who is Mark before before the tragic accident in 2009. Mm -hmm, very much so. Uh, yeah, it'd be my pleasure. Um, as the audience may have um, realized by now, you know, this accent is from Wales in the United Kingdom, uh, born in 1969 into a working class family. Um, my mum was a caretaker of a, a very small primary school mm -hmm. and my dad uh, was a crane driver. And the great story with my dad is that his father was also a crane driver. So it, it was handed down, you know, in the, in the generation. And my dad left school I'll never forget my dad telling me this story. He left school on the Friday at the age of 15. You know, this is a long time ago. And his father, whose name was Eddie, said to my dad, whose name was Cecil or Cecil, come with me Monday morning. I'll take you to the steelworks and I'm going to get you a job. Yeah. And that's what my dad did. He started work on the Monday and he stayed there for 40 years, right. you know, as a, as a crane driver. So I feel very privileged to have had a, an incredible upbringing. Uh, my mother's name was Margaret and my mum's claim to fame is that her birthday, which is the 14th of November, yeah. 
is the same as Prince Charles, now King Charles. <laughs> so that's my mum's claim to fame. So, yeah. So my background, um, as I said, grew, grew up in the 70s. Wonderful, wonderful environment. Feeling of freedom, you know, in, the, in, in Wales, you know, in the UK. And just loved that feeling of movement. And what I mean by that is, ever since I was a small child, you know, I think my parents thought there was something wrong with me because I, I could never sit still. Yeah. I was always running or playing football or cricket or cycling, but always doing something. And I, I didn't know why I was so active until later on in life when I joined British Cycling that, uh, you know, that it was identified that I had this inert um, passion, I'll use the word passion, mm -hmm. for movement you know, according to dopamine, yeah. you know, to give us that, uh, that natural feeling that some people love, some people don't like it so much, yeah. you know, but for me as a young kid, yeah, I just fell in love with movement, you know, health and well-being from a very, very young age. So studied obviously then in school, you know, in the eighties and, uh, I fell in love with volleyball, mm -hmm. you know, actually in the late eighties. And I was very lucky to actually play volleyball for Wales, for my country you know, for three years. And that was a great experience. It yeah. was a great insight into, you know, international sport. Mm. And, um, and having studied sports science, psychology, you know, it, it was a great, a great educational learning uh, journey for me, yeah. you know, as a human being. Yeah. And I think that all comes back to uh, the, the one um, piece of information that my dad gave me when I was a young kid, that, you know, we're only here once, you know, this is not a rehearsal. And I kept saying to my dad, what, what do you mean? Yeah. What, what do you mean by this? I, I don't understand what you mean. Cause I wasn't fully aware of the process of life that we are born, we live and we pass on, you know, as living sure. organisms. Mm -hmm. And my dad said to me one day, I think I was maybe 10 or 11, just be careful with your life because you know, my, my parents, as I said, thought there was something wrong with me That's true. that, um, you know, just respect that you only have one, one life, one chance mm -hmm. to live out this incredible journey. Because remember that one day in the future, tomorrow will be your last day. And I remember sitting there thinking, what, what does he mean by that? Yeah. And then he explained about obviously how we pass on. And that gave me, I think, the kick up the backside, you know, to use a Welsh term for your audience, the realization that this journey that we're on, you know, that famous clock, you know, tick, 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 you know, is very short lived actually, you know. So, so the appreciation, the gratitude and, and just having the love for life, you know, at, at a young age, you know, at a very young age. You know. That's true. I love, I love this actually. It's, it's, it's quite interesting to reflect on. Um, but the thing that it's, it's really drawn my attention, of course, with the uprising and you, you've been active all the time and you practice different sports. What basically, what's the, the drive that took you to the paragliding? So if I take the audience back to 1990, you know, mm. when I, I was, uh, I was 21 years of age, I was working in South Wales, mm. you know, um, I fell in love, you know, with, uh, with, which was then, uh, became my girlfriend, became my fiance and then my wife, okay. you know? So I think all through that journey, I felt confident enough at the age of 21, you know, which in today's numbers is pretty young yeah. to get married, you know, That's true. but I was working, I was confident. So we got married, we bought a house and then, uh, four years later, you know, my daughter, Jessica, you know, arrived. So the, the family circle felt complete. Amazing. And what that gave me was the peace of mind then to have security in my work, certainty in my family mm -hmm. and peace of mind to have unconditional love within the family, if that makes sense. Makes know? sense. Yeah. And I continued, you know, I continued my sport, you know, my cycling that then led, led me into triathlon. Mm -hmm. You know, I became a big advocate of triathlon. So that took me all through the nineties, mm. you know, and then into the two thousands, I started rock climbing, you know, I, I became a, a big fan of rock climbing yeah. because it's so challenging. It's just you and the rock. That's it's, it. It's mental. It, well, it can be, <laughs> <laughs> especially when you start climbing some really, really difficult climbs. Yeah. 
And then in 2006, um, my wife and I unfortunately grew apart, as people do. People change. Yeah. Life changes, you know, because as you know yourself, when you came to the presentation, the explanation of change is that it was it, it will always happen. Change sure. will always happen. Yeah. Okay, and you know, take the listeners back to sixty five million years ago when the the asteroid hit the hit the hit the, the Earth, the Earth. And, uh, and wiped out the dinosaurs. You know, so it will always happen. We we don't like change as human beings, but we are actually designed perfect for change. I love it. We are. You know, and and about we, did, we also we discussed this point, and I love the fact that you have built your values based on the change. So it would be really interesting just to share with us how you design these values, because I think most of us these days we take actions and we live our life without basically designing the principles and the values. So if you can take us through the values and how the change element is yeah. embedded with it, yeah, very much so. Well, I think if you evaluate your individual personality, every human being, that's ingrained into us by the time we are seven, nearly eight years of age. Mm -hmm. Everything else thereafter then is just experiences. Okay, but we have this personality that we keep with us, you know, all through our life. Yeah. So when we rebranded, you know, my business to bring me to Dubai, you know, this year in, in 2022, I evaluated quite deeply on who I was as a human being. Mm -hmm. Okay, what, what, what's really important to me and how can I add value to other people? So then we went through the, uh, the list of values and there was probably in excess of 20 okay. different values, mm -hmm. but which ones were the most important mm. and what shows up every day naturally without having to push the boundary or push the, the envelope. Yeah. You know? Put the effort and life. It's natural, mm -hmm. you know? So the analogy of change starts with the letter C mm -hmm. courageous. I feel I'm a courageous person. I've been that way all my life. Mm -hmm. H honest. In other words, honesty, showing up with honesty. Some people cross-reference it with integrity, of course. And then for me, it's being A, accountable. So if I said to you, as I did today, I'm going to turn up at this time, my integrity and my commitment is to turn up on time. Actually, you turned up 20 minutes before, which is amazing. <laughs> Thank you for that. Thank you for that. I've just allowed for the, the Dubai traffic, you know. So then you have N, okay, for nurturing. I love mm. helping people, and I'll share this with your audience very quickly. The town that I grew up in South Wales is called Tredegar, okay, or Tredegar. But Tredegar has a very famous person who actually formulated and founded the NHS, mm -hmm. the National Health Service, in the UK. A wonderful uh, Labour politician who became the health minister called Aniron Bevan, yeah. okay? He was from my town. No, not my town. I don't own the town, but you know what I mean. <laughs> and and he wanted to help the UK, okay, to transfer the you know the the service that he'd almost mm -hmm. you know invented himself. Okay. Yeah. I've had that feeling all my life to help people. It's it's just in my DNA. Okay. Amazing. So to help people through nurturing, through the holistic approach, okay, is is really important to me. Yeah. Okay. So then if you then evaluate my personal, you know, my personal values, okay, it's something that I truly enjoy sharing with other people mm -hmm. because it's worked. Yeah. It's worked for me, you know? So, so through all of the evaluations that's now helped me to share these, that's what's brought me to Dubai. You know, and then obviously, you know, the, the two final letters for me is how I um, show my genuine side. Mm -hmm. Okay, because I am just a genuine, true human being. I'm a normal guy. Yeah. I was born Margaret's boy. I was. I wasn't born a world or Paralympic <laughs> champion. I wasn't. I was born Margaret's boy, yeah. you know. So so the, the, genu the genuine side of me is the G. And then the final letter, which is E, is encouraging. Mm -hmm because my parents always encouraged me to do what I thought may be good for me. True. I didn't know, but as you saw when you came to the event, mm -hmm. the famous quote by Michael Jordan, it's okay to fail, 
That's true. Everybody fails at something. Yeah. But what's not okay is not trying. I love this one. And 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 it's obvious that especially now with the, with the our lifestyle is driven only by success stories and we've never looked into basically the big achievers how they look into failure and how feed it in to make sure that they learn and what they can do to mm-hmm. make a success. Mm-hmm. Which I really love basically how you articulated the whole story about the 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 how you achieved this big achievement and just to to mention that that you are not only a gold medalist you broke two, two world records in the same basically avenue which is quite impressive but before we step into basically your, your, your success amazing story tell us about the accident because i think this is where uh, most of us that when we face such a failure and unfortunately a lot of people that they are they sit back they don't do actions mm. and i would love to hear from you basically the story mm-hmm. and then be, we, we tackle basically sure. how you accepted the reality behind it of course so take your audience back to 2006 when my you know then wife you know we both agreed to part company and obviously go through the process of of divorce mm-hmm. you know and it was amicable so I then moved to Cardiff, which is the capital, you know, of Wales. And with my work, you know, s- sort of started just working in Cardiff as a senior accounts manager. I moved to Cardiff, you know, obviously living there in the city. Mm-hmm. So I'd gone from almost a steel town, which is a very industrial environment, to now the big city, mm-hmm. you know, as we call the big smoke. Yeah. And it was an eye opener. I had all these opportunities, you know, to participate in more sport, you know, to have more experiences, you know, every week. Yeah. That was something that that I'd I'd not been used to. Mm -hmm. You know, it was a big eye opener for me. And that gave me the opportunity to almost live out the concept of what my late father had shared with me as a child, that the process of life, which we've just spoke about, is actually very short lived in the grand scheme of things. Mm -hmm. However, what we work for, physically work for, is not what we take with us, mm. okay? So the house, the car, the shoes, the watch, the holiday home, whatever you work for. And, and you know, I commend people for working for those things. But what we do take with us is the feelings, emotions, friendships, experiences True. in life. That's what we take with us when we pass on. Mm-hmm. So everything else, we hand back. Technically, we only borrow them. Does that make sense? Makes okay. sense. Yeah. So when I moved to Cardiff, that gave me the opportunity to have all of these new experiences. I was like a child in a sweet shop. Literally all of these experiences, which then led me to qualify as a paragliding pilot into 2008 at that point. And, and I loved it. I mean, I absolutely loved the feeling of flight when your feet leave the floor and you get that Peter Pan moment for the listeners, for the audience who's watching this and listening to the podcast. It it was just a, an incredible cathartical feeling. Okay. And I couldn't get enough of it. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm not going to use the A word, but I, I became very passionate about flight, the feeling of flight and just wanted it every weekend. You know, I look forward to the Friday. Yeah. To, to know then that on the Saturday and the Sunday, I could, I could go fly in with the club that I was part of. Yeah. So let's fast forward and take the audience back. So it was May 2009, so just over 13 years ago. And the club that I was part of, we had arranged as a, as a club, and there was about 21 pilots to fly over the Gower Peninsula, which is in South Wales, just on the outskirts of Swansea. And it's the coastline the coastline of, mm-hmm. of uh, southwest Wales. So the conditions were um, were recorded to be perfect. And what I mean by that is 20 degrees temperature, um, 12, maybe 13 mile an hour headwind coming in off the sea, mm-hmm. which was almost perfect for flight, you know, for that, for that weekend. So we all arrived on the Saturday morning, just a normal s- sunny Saturday morning, you know. So we'd had a number of hours of flight through the Saturday, through the day. And then at around, probably around 5 p.m., we just sat on the hillside, just having a coffee, 
just having a chat, talking about the day and the weekend, because yeah. we were we'd planned to be there for two days. And one of the guys, I won't mention his name, but one of the guys said to me, shall we go back up? Because we've probably got maybe about an hour left before the sun sets, the wind drops, the wind, you know, sort of dissipates. We always have this friend that, okay, let's do it one more time. But in the grand scheme of things, 99% out of a, or 99 times out of 100, nothing goes wrong. True. Okay, nothing goes wrong. So I said to this guy, okay, let, let's, let's go back up, you know. So anyway, put the harnesses on, launch the canopy off the side of the hillside, you know, with the paraglide in flight. And about 15 minutes later, I'm flying across the top ridge, maybe about 15 meters above the floor, just, just enjoying the moment, you know. And as I pulled on my left brake, just to turn the canopy, you know, at sort of 90 degrees to face the, face the Irish Sea, I flew into what they call a crosswind, or what is known as a crosswind. So it's two airstreams that fight for the same space, basically. Okay. So you can't see it. You can't feel it, you can't touch it, it but it's there. Mm -hmm. And if any of your audience has ever driven over black ice, you know, if anybody has ever driven over, you know, solid ice, not knowing it's there until you drive over it and then you, you lose control of the steering wheel, for instance, it was just an incredible shock, you know, to me straight away. And as I flew into it, my whole canopy, the whole paragliding canopy just collapsed. You know, just this, and I can still close my eyes and, and hear the noise, you know, the whoosh. Next thing, I'm looking down at the grass, and the grass is coming up at a rate of knots. And within two seconds, and I, I can still hear the noise now of my boots, you know, my flying boots hitting the floor, thud. Now, I was fully conscious at this point, so I've hit the floor, not knowing what, what I've done. And then the canopy, because the wind was swirling, the canopy reinflated. Oh. Well, I'm still attached with my harness. And I got dragged probably for about 100 meters or so, uncontrollably, fully conscious. And I can, <laughs> I can, I can not laugh about it now, but I can still think of the process of just seeing the sky, the grass, the sky, the grass, the sky, the grass until it finally stopped. You know, I, I stopped tumbling, being dragged, and it was like being a rag doll in a washing machine. It was horrendous. Wow. So I'm lying on the floor, and I'm staring up at the blue sky, and I'll never forget the beautiful blue sky that afternoon. No clouds, just beautiful, light blue color. And I'm catching my breath. I'm just like <sighs> And I thought to myself, that was close. Because wow. I'm in no pain at this point. This is crazy. That was really close. Mm -hmm. So I just thought, well, I'll just sit up. I'll pull in the lines, you know, the paragliding yeah. lines, and I'll repack my canopy, and I'll walk back to the, you know, to the launch site. Mm -hmm. And as I tried to lift my shoulders off the floor, I thought, hmm, that's interesting. I, I, I can't lift my shoulders, so... I must be caught on something. My flight jacket must be caught on bracken or, or, or something, you yeah. know. And it was like being Velcroed to the floor. That's the only way I can explain it. And I thought, hmm, what's going on here? And I looked down my body at both of my legs, which was severely twisted, you know, like two pipe cleaners. And I thought, oh dear. I think I've done something pretty serious here because my legs are just mangled. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh my gosh, it looks like I've broke both my legs. That was the only vision I had, okay? Now, one of the other paragliding pilots who saw me crash, he looped down as quick as he possibly could okay. from about 300 feet down, you know, onto the grass. He landed safely. He unclipped, you know, his paragliding canopy and he ran over as quick as he possibly could. And he stood by my side, and I'll never forget this guy staring down at me. And he says to me, oh my gosh, are you still alive? Wow. I said, yes, but I, I, I can't feel my legs. There's no movement, there's no feeling. And yeah, the says, brain did not register yet. Nothing, mm -hmm. zero, just a state of calmness, actually, wow. you know. And he said, 
don't move? I said, I can't. <laughs> I, I can't. I physically can't move because I tried to put myself into the recovery position just in case I passed out and I, was, I vomited, you know, oh. which is dangerous. Mm -hmm. Stroma. So, so he radioed for the, the Wales Air Ambulance, which is a charity in Wales, and they have um, helicopters, you know, that, that treat, um, you know, patients in, in all um, environments. Could be in the mountains, could be a car crash, could be a, a house fire, whatever. Yeah. You know? And they arrive within probably 10 or 11 minutes from literally, you know, 100 miles away. And I'll never forget lying on the floor and I could just feel my body getting cold because of the shock, you know, mm -hmm. the blood is obviously going to the damaged area now. So this gentleman put his jacket over me just to keep me, you know, keep me, um, you know, warm, even in the, the beautiful warm sun. And then I could hear, which is the helicopter coming yeah. in, you know? Yeah. And I thought, oh, great. I'm in good hands now, mm -hmm. you know? So the Wales Air Ambulance, you know, they stabilized me with morphine, you know, they put the neck collar on me and a chest brace, yeah. and then obviously, carefully because they didn't know what I'd done at this point even though they checked me over um, but they knew I'd done something pretty serious mm -hmm. so they you know they lifted me onto the the spinal board yeah you know very they very you. very very carefully and then I got airlifted off you know to hospital to then arrive in hospital have the MRI have the x-rays and then to be told that evening you know that I'd broken my back Wow. And I remember saying to the doctor, can you just say that? Can, can you just say that one more time? Because it, it just wasn't registering. Yeah, yeah. You know, and he said, you've, you've broken your back. You've broken T12, which is the vertebrae around belly button, mm -hmm. you know, your belly button level. And you've got a huge thoracic fracture. When you hit the floor, basically the compression, you know, when you hit the floor, your whole body compressed. And T12 just cracked. Snapped. Just the cracked. whole spine. Like. Just cracked. Wow. So thankfully, I didn't have any um, any severe spinal cord damage. In other words, the spinal cord wasn't you know severed, but all of the fragments from the vertebrae, you mm -hmm. know, when it broke, it um, it cut into you know very slightly cut into the nerves around the vertebrae which basically has now left me, you know, with, uh, with lower leg paralysis. So technically only half of the muscles in my legs work mm -hmm. basically. Mm -hmm. So that I suppose in reality was the end of my life as I knew it. Yeah. But technically it was probably the start of a new life, you know, having spent after my spinal operation, I had six titanium pins inserted into my spine, you know, through T10, T11 and L1 to um to stabilize you know my my spine around the damaged area and then 94 days on my back just staring at the ceiling you know no movement no feeling and almost a a state of meditation mm -hmm. because when you physically can't do something you just relax you just think well i'm just gonna lie here and just wait for mother nature to take her course I love this. Actually, it's it's, uh, it's again trying to imagine such accidents in our life, how they might turn up to like a milestone and how things can move. But what is the thing that let you accept the reality after this? Because I like the fact that your mind started to think about such an accident. And first, did you accept it at the beginning and how basically you went through the process? to become the mark you are now, which is another story. Yeah, well, I think, you know, just to, just to join the dots, really. Um, yeah, it, well, it was 94 days in hospital when, you know, they finally hoisted me out of bed. They gave me a frame, a walk-in frame, mm -hmm. you know, and it had my name on it. It was really embarrassing. It yeah. really was, okay. Yeah. But it was a, a very small step towards being functional again okay at some point in my life yeah you know was was i ever going to walk again was i ever going to leave the hospital my thoughts for many many months was well will i ever leave this hospital bed will i ever will i ever walk again who knows true who knows yeah so through the rehabilitation in hospital you know they they started to identify which parts of my legs did work and which didn't 
okay? And that was pretty simplistic. So both my feet don't work. So I have no push or pull mm -hmm. in both feet, okay? Or for the, 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 the technical people out there, no <laughs> dorsiflexion and no plant deflection. <laughs> and that's two words that I learned in hospital, okay? <laughs> so, so identifying which muscles worked and which didn't allowed me then to start to walk again with crutches, you mm -hmm. know, with walking aids and retrain in the secondary muscles to do the primary muscles job. To compensate. Compensate, mm -hmm. okay. So after four, just probably around four and a half months in hospital, my parents came to visit one night. And I'll share this with the audience because this, this is quite important. It's a usual visit. It's a normal visit. It's a one hour visit. Parents turn up, obviously conversation, improvements on a daily basis. I'm now starting to walk the length of the gym, mm -hmm. which is 20 meters. It's a huge step in the right direction to get back to normality and functionality. Yeah. So my parents were probably there for 45 minutes and my mum said to my dad, I'm just gonna nip to the bathroom and then when I come back, we'll make our way home mm -hmm. because their home was about an hour away from the hospital. And obviously both parents are retired, but they still wanna get home. Yeah. You know, they don't wanna be turning up late, you know, mm -hmm. to, to go to bed. So we're having this conversation. My mum goes to the bathroom and my dad is sat there. Now my dad was known as Mr. Nice Guy. He was a gentleman, mm -hmm. a, a true gentleman. And he pulls his, he pulls his chair closer towards me. Now picture the scene. I'm lying in this hospital bed. I've just started to walk again on crutches and a walking frame. And I'm just lying there, you know, peacefully. And the bed's at 45 degrees. And my dad pulls his chair forward to me and he says, come here. I said, sorry. He said, come here. So I sort of tried to shuffle, you know, forward. And my dad leaned forward off the end of his chair and he caught hold of the scruff of my t-shirt, you know, the top of my t-shirt. Now my dad was never nasty. And my dad had perfectly light blue eyes, almost like a husky dog. Mm -hmm. Anybody's ever seen the eyes of a husky dog? Perfect, perfect light blue. And he's staring into my eyes with this what I now know was not aggression, but it was care. It was the feel, the feeling compassion. of caring and compassion. And he says to me, no, you listen to me. And I'm thinking, is he going to punch me? <laughs> is he going to punch me? I don't need this. You know, he says, no, listen, you're going to get through this. And I'm crying. You can imagine I've been crying now for weeks and weeks and weeks. I said, dad, I broke my back. How am I going to get through this? He said, you're going to get through this because you're a winner. Are you listening to me? Now you stop crying. You stop upsetting your mum. You stop upsetting me and you pull yourself together because you're going to get through this. Now don't tell your mum we've had this conversation because she, <laughs> she would have killed him, you know. But that is known as a, a pattern interrupt. Breaking, yeah. Breaking my mindset. True. And that's exactly what I needed. You know, that's exactly what I needed. So then when I finally left hospital, I started to focus on what I could do rather than what I couldn't do. I couldn't run anymore, couldn't skip anymore, couldn't rock climb. I promised my parents I'd never fly again and I haven't, okay, because I can't. But then I knew that if I started to get functional again, okay, that would improve my fitness, mm -hmm. that would improve my health, that I could get back to some form of life i love it and that's that's a perfect basically turn to uh, the thing that i read uh, during the talk that the best dreams happen when you are awake 100 percent. and uh, i reflected on this message and i'm sure that you thought about it in a way that okay this has happened and how am i going to react to it and what are the things that i can do it physically but for some most importantly, the mental thing. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Because, you know, I'd gone through that time in hospital of thinking of euthanasia, thinking of the end. Yeah. And I kept thinking, if my life is going to be like this, okay, for the next, you know, I was 40 when I broke my back. So if my life is going to be like this for the next 40 years, which was a huge, unprecedented change as a human, yeah. physically, mentally, and emotionally, and almost spiritually to a certain degree. And I remember saying to my dad, you know what? I think I'll just end it. 
I can't live like this for the rest of my life. You know, I can't. So it's, I suppose it's only, I wouldn't use the word normal, but that's what I'm thinking. It's only normal to look and think of other options to take you out of the bad, the bad situation or the bad place yeah. where, where you're at. You know, you just look for, for something better than where you are. And I suppose that was the easiest option, you know, just to end it, you know? Yeah. So, so when I finally left hospital and I'll never forget the consultant, a wonderful, wonderful gentleman, um, called Dr. <laughs> Dr. Clive Inman said to my dad, when my dad picked me up, you know, from the hospital, just look after him. This, you know, he's a special one. This, this kid is a special one, you know? Um, he said, but just be prepared, Mark, that your future life may not be like your past life, you know, in terms of physicality, yeah. sport. So, mm -hmm. so I hope Mr. Inman was watching the London 2012 Paralympic Games. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's amazing. That, that takes us actually that based on this mindset, which I strongly believe that it's important that your biggest achievement. And I'm not sure even when, when you talk about it, that you even, you didn't even expect it or you did not even plan for it. So what basically, or who's the person that put you on the back on track and consider the cycling as a sport and that take us through the journey yeah, of you became part of the sky team. Yeah. Great, great question actually. So, you know, for the audience, I left hospital, uh, September, 2009. I started going to the gym, you know, started sitting on the, you know, on the indoor, um, the indoor cycling, you mm -hmm. know, trainer, because what they did in hospital, they found that when I sit on the bike, I could actually push and pull the pedals mm. because of half of my legs. Actual working. Yeah. So my quads and my hip flexors work. And what they did in hospital, because remember now my feet don't work. Okay. My feet don't work is that they bandaged my feet to the pedals in hospital. Okay. Because otherwise my feet would just fall off. Mm -hmm. they'd, they'd flop off, you know, they'd slide off. So that was my first experience of marginal gains in movement, mm -hmm. in physiology, in movement, you know? So I knew when I left hospital, I just needed somebody to help me onto the bike. Okay. Clip in my cycling shoes, you know, and then when I'm clipped in, I can push and pull. It feels normal. Okay. Whereas off the bike, you know, to give people, you know, a metaphor, I walk like Charlie Chaplin, mm -hmm. you know, as an analogy, I walk, I walk with this gate that they call it, you yeah. know, the, the waddle. So my dad used to help me, you know, every week just to, you know, I suppose, help me onto the bike and then I'd go and cycle, you know, just for an hour gentle to start with yeah. and then build up the hours, you know, one hour to two hours to three hours, because I've always had a big engine. I've, I've got huge lungs, you know, the background of athleticism. you know, so my lung capacity is around 6.1 liters, mm -hmm. which is huge. So, so I knew that if I started to cycle, that would then in turn help with my health, help with my mental health, my physical health to maybe just maybe go back to work because that's what my parents wanted. Yeah. Okay. And then in 2010, just over a year after my accident, I participated in a charity cycle ride for the air ambulance. Remember the guys who treated me on mm. the day of my crash. Yeah. So I genuinely, I genuinely wanted to give back. I wanted to help raise money for this incredible organization. Now remember reciprocity or giving back is in my DNA. Yeah. I don't have to force it. Yeah. It's there. So I said to the organization, I'd love to help raise money, you know, for the, the air ambulance. And they were doing a charity cycle ride around Wales in a week. Mm -hmm. And it was about 900 kilometers in the week. So I just thought, I've got to do this. I've got to do this. These, these people saved my life. Yeah. I've got to do it. You know, I, I, I'm so grateful. So, so we set out on the first day and it was about 22 people participating in the charity cycle ride. So we finished the day 84 miles. And we arrived at the, the village where we were staying in Wales. So picture the scene. We finished. I've had my shower. I've had a sports massage. I'm just having my food in the clubhouse. And I received this tap on the shoulder. Mm -hmm. And I turns around and there's a guy behind me, about 110 kilos of muscle. And he says to me, when you finish your food, young man, I'd like a quiet word with you outside. 
I was like, oh dear, <laughs> what have I done? Yeah. I've not seen this guy like all day. Who is he? But he's huge. I mean, like the Hulk, huge. So I finished my food. I'm on my crutches at the time, you know, my walking sticks. I took them with me just in case. <laughs> so I goes out and this guy is, is stood there in shorts and t-shirt. And he says to me, uh, what's wrong with your legs? So I explained lower leg paralysis. I broke my back 12 months ago, but I can cycle and the air ambulance saved my life. I'm raising money, you know, funds for the, the organization. So after this 20 minute conversation about my physicality, my disability, my accident and my mindset, he then asked me this question, which completely changed my life and the course of my life forever. He says to me, um, so what do you do? I said, well, I'm, a, I'm, an, I'm an accounts manager. I work in Cardiff, et cetera, et cetera. Big salary, company car, blah, blah, blah. He said, no, 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 no. What, what do you do? I said, I've just explained. He said, okay, can I ask you a question? I said, yeah, of course. No, this was June, 2010. And he said to me, are you training for the London 2012 Paralympic Games? <laughs> I said, sorry. He said, are you training for the Paralympics in two years time? I said, no. Why the hell would I do that? He said, because I think you should. That was it. That was the light bulb moment. Yeah. And I said, can I ask you a question? He said, yeah, of course. I said, who are you? <laughs> who are you? Guardian angel. He said, my name is Dr. Ben Matthews. Mm -hmm. I'm a chiropractor from Cardiff and I understand what's going on with your body, you know, physically. Mm -hmm. I see, I see athletes in my clinic every day, big, powerful, strong athletes, yeah. male and female, but I've never met anybody like you. So he saw a glimpse of brilliance in me that yeah. I knew I had the ability. I just needed the opportunity. So I gave him a hug. I said, thank you. Okay. We finished the ride for the week, you know, af after the five, six days. And I'll never forget walking back into my parents' house on the Saturday night after the ride and saying to my parents, have a guess what I'm going to start doing next week. And my mum said, what's that, Mark? I said, mum, I'm going to start training for the Paralympic Games in London in two <laughs> years time. Okay. And my mum's response was, oh, um, okay, well, good luck. <laughs> What would you like to eat? <laughs> and my dad came into the kitchen and he said, all right, Mark, how was your week? Great week, dad, loved it, amazing, raised loads of money for the air ambulance. He said, what's this, um, what's this Paralympic thing you're talking about? So I told him, you know, the Olympics and Paralympics were coming to London in two years time. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to get there. I just wanted to be there. Just to prove it to myself first. Just to be there, just mm -hmm. to have the experience. It's a home games. Mm -hmm. You know, we've got the World Cup coming to Qatar now in two months' time. Yeah. I just want to be there, mm -hmm. you know? And my dad said, listen now, come here. And he put his arm around me and he said, listen, just go back to work. I said, what? He said, just go back to work. You've broke your back. Just go back to work. Come That's on. 12 you, months. 12 months ago. Yeah. You're 40, 41 years of age. Come on. Forget this Olympic, Paralympic dream you've always had since you was a kid. I said, Dad, come here. I said, remember what you taught me as a child. If you have a dream, whatever that dream is, never give up. Until your eyes finally close for good, never give up. And I'm going to do this with or without you. Because London's going to happen with or without me. Now, if you're going to join me on this journey... I love you, love you for life. Thank you. Yeah. You know, as my dad, as my father, I love you unconditionally anyway. But if you're going to join me, great. If you're not going to join me, that's also okay. Yeah. Okay. And he turned to my mother and he said, Margaret, <laughs> have a word with him. Have a word with your son. I think he's lost it. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the start. The clock, think about this. The clock was ticking for mm -hmm. London. We were two years away and the clock was ticking, just over 700 days and the clock was ticking. So I had to do everything I possibly could within my wisdom 
just to get there because that was the that was the concept that's the concept that was the concept i love it and and of course it will take us through the journey of becoming uh, the the official cyclist and in, in, in the in the in great britain but i'm interested to know every time you look to the medal now what do you feel great question what do i feel i think my first answer would be disbelief disbelief because even now yeah even now 10 years on from london i still wake up you know every day and my first feeling is gratitude i open my eyes and i'm like yes another day in paradise love it and that's that's how i feel but back to the disbelief you know, as I said earlier on, I, I, I was just a normal guy, a normal guy with a gift, a gift to win, you know, a Paralympic gold medal. And we'll come on to the double world records in a second. Mm -hmm. But the value for me is what does that medal do to help other people? Does that make sense? Yeah. You know, the value is in what it does for other people, True. which is part of the legacy of London 2012 to inspire a generation that's that's the value behind the the medal itself yeah. you know the journey and it, there's an old saying you know in um, in professional sport is the journey to the top easy hell no is it possible uh, absolutely mm -hmm. you know absolutely so my journey to get to london i had to first of all get selected by British Cycling. And there's a great story for your audience. My first cycling coach was a wonderful gentleman called Neil Smith. And I, I met Neil Smith. I didn't know what he did for a living. And he was just, in my eyes, just a cycling coach who I met every Saturday, okay, in the velodrome in South Wales. Little did I know that this gentleman had a huge corporate job, okay, one of the, you know, one of the most senior positions in the company that he worked for. And it's a global company. I won't mention any names. And I didn't know this, okay? So my respect for Neil just literally went through the roof because mm -hmm. this gentleman was giving up his time for four hours on a Saturday to coach disabled people how to cycle, okay? So I had a big admiration for Neil. So when Neil said to me, do this, I said, okay because I'm coachable, I'm very coachable. Yeah. So Neil took me as a facilitator, almost as a talent scout, to then offer me into British cycling, you know, mm -hmm. and this, this was the conversation. I said to Neil, I'd like to commit for the next two years to get to London 2012. And he said, okay, I'll help you, because he'd already trained world and Paralympic champions yeah. previously mm -hmm. to then hand them over to British cycling. Yeah. So you know the whole process. The process, yeah. okay, as a talent scout. Mm. So he said, I just need two things from you, commitment and trust. You do the rest. I said, okay, let's do it. So we shook, literally shook hands because yeah. we were both, you know, a adults. Mm -hmm. So he rang British Cycling and he said to the head coach, I've got this guy, um, he's broken his back, he's got lower leg paralysis, but he's got a big engine. He's really powerful on the bike, you know. So British cyclists said, well, where's he come from? Because we've never seen him before. We, we don't know who is Mark Colborne. And Neil's answer was, well, he's fell out of the sky. <laughs> <laughs> Literally. <laughs> Literally out of the sky, you know. So, so British cyclists said, okay, we'll give, you, we'll give you an opportunity over 2011 to race in five races as a guest rider, okay? Just as a guest rider for British cycling. So five races, uh, time trial races, um, I came back with five medals. Mm -hmm. wow. British cycling were like, hmm, this go is far. interesting. Mm -hmm. There may be something in this. So for me to get to the games, I then had to medal or podium in one of the world championships, either on the road or the track. Okay. So I won a silver in the 10 mile time trial in Denmark, okay, on the road. Um, and then over the winter of 2010 into 11, um, I'd, I'd, I'd done some road um, time trialing, you mm -hmm. know, with my disability. 
But with my power, what Neil found on the track was that, think about the track on the velodrome. There's no roundabouts. There's no speed humps. There's no potholes. It's just, it's clinical, Mm -hmm. which suited my disability. So then from the uh, autumn of 2011 through the winter of 2011, British Cycling said, okay, let's try you on the track. Let's see how good you are on the track. We know how good you are on the road. Mm -hmm. You can go and smash 23 minutes for 10 miles. We know Different environment. we, We know you can do that. So they took me into the velodrome in Manchester, started doing some training and testing, and exponentially my times just just got quicker and quicker and quicker because there was no disturbances as i said no holes no potholes no roundabouts because of my disability mm-hmm. you know so within 3 months i was probably within 5% of world record pace now remember we're still 10 months from london 2012 yeah so british cycling were really excited because remember they don't select bronze or silver medalists yeah they only select potential gold medalists to take you from good to great mm. over that duration yeah, of yeah. time you know unfortunately um through the winter you know of 2011 um my dad you know mr nice guy who was my hero my inspiration my go-to guy ended up with stomach cancer and i just thought oh really you know i knew my dad was going to pass away because we're all going to pass away yeah. but i just didn't want to see him ill you know So over the winter, he just deteriorated and ended up, you know, having what they call end of life care. And then I got selected for the the World Track Championships in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And if I then medaled in Los Angeles, then I'm on the radar for London 2012. Potential, potential. So we flew to Los Angeles when I got selected. And uh, and then five days later, you know, my mum rang me. To say unfortunately my dad had passed away peacefully you know in his sleep you know which i suppose was a blessing even though it was heartbreaking but this was a day before the finals the world finals wow. you know so i was in pretty good condition physically and now i have this curveball you know of my be- of my best friend who was now gone yeah you know so that's when my coach rang british cycling to speak to the the sports psychologist you know, Professor Steve Peters, who I believe uh, you've read his wonderful book. Yeah, we're going to talk about <laughs> it because, again, it blew my mind uh, when we reflect on the on the logical and the emotional. So imagine, you know, for your audience, you know, uh, listening to this po- beautiful podcast, this wonderful podcast and obviously on uh, on video. Picture the scene. I'm sat on my bed in Los Angeles. I'm 12,000 miles from home. My mum is obviously at home, you know, with my late dad who's just passed away. So my coach rang Dr. Steve Peters, explained the situation. So he puts me on the phone, you know, to, uh, to Steve. And he said, Mark, you know, first of all, please accept my sincere condolences for the loss of your dad. Yeah. I said, thank you. He said, I'd like you to take a seat. I've got three questions for you and I need an answer because we need to prepare what's going to happen next. I said, okay. He said, so my first question is, if we fly you home today to be with your mum, that's okay. But your dad's not coming back. I said, okay. Second option, second question, you stay in Los Angeles and you don't race. You just watch, you know, and you, you grieve, but your dad's not coming back. Okay. Thirdly, you stay, you prepare, and you race tomorrow in the finals for your country. But your dad's not coming back. I need an answer. I'll give you one minute to to think about it, but I need an answer. Because we need to prepare. What what are you going to do? I said, okay, I'm going to stay. I'm going to race for my country, for Great Britain. But more importantly, I'm going to race for my dad. And he literally said, okay, thank you, good luck. And he put the phone down, click. That's it. I said, hello, hello. (laughs) He's gone because that's reality. There is nothing else to do. That's logical thinking. That's true. I believe there is a time to be emotional. Of course, there, there is a time to be emotional, but there's a time and a place. This was now not the time. Mm -hmm. Preparing for the world finals to almost 
tick off the very first part of my childhood dream. Because if I meddled in the world, then I'm on the radar for London 2012. So we prepared, you know, for the next day, my coach and I, it was a, my British cycling coach, a wonderful, wonderful young man called Tom Stanton, yeah. you know, and Tom and I almost became very, very close friends. And, uh, and then the next day in the finals, in the three kilometer pursuit, so for your audience, it's 12 laps of the velodrome. It's around four minutes, but four minutes flat out. Wow. So think of the lactic acid buildup. For a sprint. It's flat out. You've, you've, you have to pace yourself, but you go out as quick and as hard as you can, and then you just hold on. Hold on for grim death, wow. you know. So, so the race, as I said, you know, I, I remember turning up to the velodrome. I remember warming up, but I can't remember the race. I remember the gun going off, you know, and then chasing the rider. Um, a gentleman from Spain, a great friend of mine called Jose Mendez. And I actually caught him after eight and a half laps and passed him. And that meant the race was over. Yeah. So to win a world championship gold medal on the track to become a world champion, you know, the number one in, in my sport in the world was just the stuff of dreams, you know, it really yeah. was. So, so that then was the first step in stone then for the next sort of seven months, you know, to prepare for, you know, for the biggest challenge of my life, which was London 2012. It's, it's it's that's really insp inspirational and i'm really interested to 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 cover the point with uh, dr peters because again the book uh, give a perspective of the emotions and and how the human mind think and how you mix between the emotion and the logic uh i'm sure that there was kind of i wouldn't say recovery sessions with him but what are the things that you were able to take you from being emotionally contained and at the same time achieving the training and the process that led you to the final race. Yeah, which yeah. Is another so, so just think of the process for one moment, the logical process of training. So to get your body, and we'll just touch on the body to start with, to get your body ready for a certain, um, a certain time, okay, in the duration of history. So we knew that the London Paralympics was going to be the end of August 2012. Okay, okay. within a week, within mm -hmm. a one week. So you mm -hmm. can prepare for that time, okay, that space in time. And then when they give you the date of the race, which is the 31st of August, okay, which is actually my wedding anniversary date. Okay. Which is a bit freaky, isn't it? <laughs> okay, but it gets worse. <laughs> okay, it, get, it gets worse. We'll come on that. We'll come to that in a second. So my coach said to me about five months before the games, your race is going to be on the 31st of August. So we can now laser focus on that date mm -hmm. to get you at the right weight. Okay. To do enough training, because obviously we were doing, you know, hundreds and hundreds of miles of m training every week. Yeah. Okay. And then you've got the additional work off the bike. So the diet. So I was told what to eat, when to eat, how much to eat. Okay. How much fluid to drink, when to drink when to sleep, mm -hmm. when to stretch, when the foam roller, okay. Full system. A full system. And I mean, it was almost down to the, the, the fifth per 15 minutes each day of what you do. It's very controlled yeah. because it has to be, mm -hmm. it's almost like the military. Okay. So that journey from February when I won the worlds all the way through to August was, um, was detailed. Okay. Process. Process, detailed, driven week on week on week and I loved it because my job was just to train to get into the best physical mental emotional state I could for August everything else was done as a professional athlete you know your bike is maintained you know even your kit at the airport is carried you yeah. know but to answer your question with Steve Peters Dr Peters it's how you train the brain Okay, to prepare for what we call the panic zone. So when you sit in your sofa, just for the audience, just to give you an analogy, when you sit in your sofa and you're chilling, that's your comfort zone. Okay, then when you start to train and you do physical things, that's the stretch zone. Okay, when you race in an Olympic or a Paralympic final, that's the panic zone. Does that make sense? 
you can't you can't replicate that moment because it's only going to happen once but what you can do through visualization and practice is to replicate that moment even though it's not the true moment does that make sense okay full sense so over that period of 7 months you start to take the body through the physical preparation mm-hmm. of what's going to happen the emotional feelings of what's going to happen how am i going to feel walking into the velodrome 7000 people a million people on tv how am i going to feel so that's where dr steve peters comes in to evaluate what you're thinking with the pillars of change apprehension fear doubt and uncertainty which is what we all go through as human beings yeah, that's right. when we go through change mm-hmm. and it's understanding and educating yourself to know that when you do go into that moment logical thinking not emotional thinking will win whatever's going to win yeah okay yeah. whatever the outcome is going to be mm-hmm. so going through that process of even listening with headphones like we have today mm-hmm. okay listening to crowd noise listening to the beeps of the okay. start gun you know beep 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 or micro stresses 100% yeah so when you then turn up and you go through that process the body's already been there yeah hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times but the mental this is why when we used to do our training in the velodrome we'd go in and do one hour of just starts mm-hmm. for an hour yeah. probably do like 10 starts okay and then go home and rest that's it that that's your training done that's true you know just 100% explosive starts so when you get to the moment and the gun goes off your body's fully prepared fully prepped and ready yeah. for that one moment to give it 100% you know that's that's really interesting and uh, this leads me to the question that in your opinion and your experience of course what's the ratio between the mental and the physical because you went through the process of preparation but maybe you were not exposed to the competition environment which is something that we all face and, and take me for example that I participate from time to time in the competition just for the sake of putting not only my physical capacity to see how my mental capacity will handle the situation. So I'm really interested to see your perspective what's the balance between the mindset and the mind mm-hmm. versus the ment- uh, the physical part. So in my opinion leading up to leading up to the uh, leading up to the games you know if you think of London 2012 or just think of 2012 think of the epic summer of sport that year we had a tour de france winner you know we had a wimbledon winner and then we had the olympics which was a great warm up for the paralympics mm. it really was yeah but going into the games you know that physically you have to do everything you possibly can to get to the 31st of august so to answer your question going into the games it was probably 95% physical okay physical because on the 30th of august you can't do any more does that make sense it's yeah. done then isn't it yeah. okay so your tank is then full then it's mental so that 95 if, to use numbers 99 if you want 99% up until that date is physical mm-hmm. okay and preparation and planning you know positivity lifestyle diet health well-being but on the 30th of august you can't do any more that's it then you're in the lap of the gods yeah then it becomes more mental than physical mm-hmm. because you are physically prepared because you can't do any more so i'll never forget waking up on the morning of the 31st of august as i said which was my uh, my wedding anniversary which is quite a weird <laughs> feeling <laughs> and 12 months previously when we had done our evaluation our physiological evaluation with british cycling the nutritionist said to me 12 months previous when he did my body evaluation of my skeleton size mm-hmm. my muscle density my fat percentage my height my weight he said to me and I, i'm i'm so glad i didn't bet him he said to me that when i race in the august okay by qualifying because you have to qualify that I will race on 78 kg. Okay. Now at the time I was about 83 kg. So you have to lose weight. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But it's over a duration of 12 months. It's okay. a very slow process mm-hmm. of, of what they call a calorie deficit. Okay. 
And I woke up that morning, I stood on the scales, and I was 78 kilos on the button. Wow. On the money. Not 78.1, 77.9. 78 on the money. That's the precision of the process and of professional sport. It's like Formula One, mm -hmm. you know, precision. So, so picture the scene. You know, we've gone into the, the velodrome that morning. I've done my warm up. You know, everything is pre planned, literally minute by minute by minute by minute. And I sat there in the pen. There were 7,000 people in the velodrome. And I'm sat there. Now, as the world champion in this event, I had the luxury of riding last in qualification. Mm -hmm. So my coach comes over and he says, look, the race that's going on now is the last race. Yeah. Get ready, start to prep ready, get yourself ready mentally, physically, you know, ready to, to go onto the track when they call your name and your number. I said, okay. Okay. So I've done my warm up, done my stretching, done another, another small warm up to reactivate. And there was a young lad from China who raced before me in the qualification. And he broke the world record in my event. Mm -hmm. How rude. <laughs> <laughs> okay, raise the bar. So, so my coach said, look, we, you know, we, we've got to reevaluate the schedule here because you've now got to break the world record exactly. just to get into the final, which was four hours later that day. How that put you mentally, uh, knowing that he broke the world record? It's, I think it's because you're already set. It's just a notion. Mm. That's all it is, is just a notion. It's just a, uh, it, yeah, it's just a notion of a thought. My focus is on doing my best. Okay. Because back to Steve Peters, going into the games, he said to me, do you have any questions? I said, well, I've got one question. What if I fail? What if I've just given up two years of my life, my job, you know, to move to Manchester, to become a professional athlete, to go to London, and then come back home with nothing. Yeah. He said, can I ask you a question? I said, yeah, of course. He said, when you go into these races, are you going to give 99% and keep your fingers crossed, okay, that you're gonna win? Or are you gonna give 100% and accept the outcome? I said, well, I'm gonna give 100%, of course yeah. I am, okay? He said, so what are you worried about? Because if you give 100%, and you accept the outcome, you have to, because you, you couldn't give, or you cannot give 110%. That doesn't exist. Whoever came up with that theory- Absolutely agree. It doesn't exist. There is nothing called 110%. It doesn't it's exist. 100%. You give your best and you accept the outcome. True. You have to be proud of your effort more than what you achieve. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Focusing on the process more than the outcome. 100%, okay. So he said, well, as long as you give 100%, whatever happens, you have to be proud because you know in your heart. You gave your best. You gave your best. Absolutely. Okay. And there's a great poem that I recite now on stage as a speaker, you know, called The Man in the Glass, which is really powerful. So my coach said to me, right, Mark, this is the schedule that we now have to break the world record to get into the final later that afternoon. I said, okay, let's do it. Amazing. Let's do it. So I'll never forget the commentator that morning over the tannoy in the velodrome, Mark Colborn, Great Britain, number 42, which was my age. <laughs> you can't write this stuff, can you? <laughs> Come to the start line, please. We're ready for your race. So the qualification ride, you know, I, I smashed the world record by about seven seconds because I wanted to prove a point that when we then race in the final, this young lad from China, you know, he was probably shaking in his boots. Yeah, exactly. Someone, thinking, someone is behind me. Thinking, wow, <laughs> you know, this guy has not just broken my world record by like one or two or three seconds. He smashed it out of the park. Yeah. Seven seconds is huge. So the gentleman from the World Drug Association stepped over after the, the race and he said to my coach, you know, we, we need a sample. You know, what, what Mark just did was just, was unbelievable. Yeah. But they through the, the legal system, they have to wait until after the final, which is the same day, you know? So I took myself backstage, you know, after the, you know, the high fives and the hugs with all the staff. And my coach said, look, just, you know, go and prep now ready for four hours time. So that's what I did. You know, I went backstage, back of the velodrome, found myself a quiet corner, 
you know, fell asleep fa- actually for about for about twenty minutes. Total shutdown. Total shutdown. <laughs> some food, some fluid, some stretching, and then three o'clock that afternoon, you know, it was uh, it was back to the velodrome floor, and then back to perform once again. Love it. And uh, this is basically the moment when, when uh, of course, I'm going to share the, the, the video and, and the clip of, of the race, which is impressive because I felt the energy. We usually watch the Olympics and we, we watch the, the races, but the breakthrough of such a race was with this basically background. Mm. It, it can give a total different perspective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think especially for anybody watching any journey for any individual, whether it's business relationships, um, friendships, or in my case, you know, the, the journey to, to Olympic gold, you know, it's, um, it, it's very cathartical because then you have an understanding which gives you an appreciation mm-hmm. of what it takes to go from breaking your back to breaking world records. Absolutely. And that's why to answer your first question, how do you feel when you look at the medal? Yeah. It's almost a feeling of disbelief, you know, a total disbelief. So picture the scene, it's 3 p.m. on the 31st of August, 2012. I've broken the world record that morning. Technically, I should have had two days rest. Okay. If you think of physiologically how your body works Mm -hmm. with lactic Mm -hmm. acid. So my coach said, make sure that you're at the track, you know, warming up, ready, at least an hour before, you know, to get the body, get the muscles, get the heart, get the blood pumping, you know, through the preparation. And... I remember that afternoon just looking around thinking, you know, my dad would never believe this. Yeah. <laughs> he would never believe me, yeah. you know. But my point is, before I share the detail of the race, what if I'd listened to my dad? What if I'd gone back to work? Mm-hmm. You know, back as senior accounts manager in Cardiff, in Wales, in the UK, just doing my thing, looking after my, my customers. The world of cycling would have never have known I existed. Absolutely. You know, the world of sport would have never have known, you know. So I did my warm up, you know, as I was told, as I was coached, got myself ready. And then quarter past three, literally that afternoon, half past three, I thought, this is it. Okay, I'm just going to leave everything on the track, everything. If I if I step off the track after I finish, great. If they carry me off in a stretcher, I've been there. <laughs> Fine. So be it. So I'd almost accepted the ultimate, um, the ultimate um, feeling, mm-hmm. you know, of what was going to happen, you know. Um, so, yeah. So that afternoon, they called my name and my number once again. I did my warm up and my coach. I'll never forget when they racked the bike up in the gate, you know, on the velodrome, because I'm now racing against this kid who's 18 years younger than me. Wow. And my coach said, look, Mark, he said, this, uh, this young lad's really quick. Over mm. the first four or five laps, he's really quick because he's a sprinter, an yeah, out-and-out sprinter. Yeah. He said, uh, my only concern is he may go for the catch. Okay. Which basically means if he, if he goes out full blast and he catches you after four or five, six laps, the race is over. Mm. I said, Tom, he's not going to catch me. And he said, Mark, he's really quick. I said, I know, but he's not going to catch me because when that gun goes off and I come out of that gate on that bike, I'm going to ride that bike like I've stolen it. (laughs) And I'm from South Wales, so that was easy. (laughs) So he laughed and he said, "Okay, can we take it serious? This is the Paralympic final. Mm. I said, yeah, 100%. So they racked the bike up in the gate and he came over to me and I'll never forget Tom's eyes just looking at me. And he says to me, are you ready? I said, you bet. He said, do this for your dad. Beep, beep, beep. So the gun then goes off. All the prep had been done. All the mileage had been done. Thousands and thousands of miles of training. Emotionally, I was ready. I knew what was going to happen after Mm -hmm. that gun goes off. 7,000 people were going to be screaming. Yeah. I knew that was going to happen. The first corner was going to feel like I was weightless because the body now is starting to function. Mm-hmm. The blood is pumping. The heart is catching up from 120 beats per minute to 150. And then after lap two, I'm up to speed. I've hit 50 kilometers an hour. 
I'm holding on to the tri bars and then the race starts. I'm still waiting for my heart rate to catch up. 160, 170, lap four. I could feel my blood pumping. The noise was like an aeroplane going overhead, you know? And I get to lap five and I'm now literally weightless. It's a feeling of weightlessness because the body now is functioning almost like a Bugatti. Everything is functioning perfect. And I could I could literally feel my heart on lap six thumping dum, 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 in my chest. Mm-hmm. And I knew I was on 200 beats per minute at that point because that's the feeling you get. And then I kept thinking to myself, just do two things. Just breathe and pedal. Breathe and pedal. That's all I had to do. Mm-hmm. That's all I had to do. So lap eight, we're literally now around two and a half to three minutes into the race. And as I came down the track, lap eight into lap nine, I'm looking up the track, looking at my coach. So he tells me if I'm up or down on my schedule. Mm -hmm. And my head starts to almost like, it it is a thumping feeling of lactic acid running through your body. The curtain started to close. So this is the feeling now that I knew I was on maximum, 202 beats per minute, full pelt, down the back straight. And as I looked up the track, expecting just to see... 70 or 80 meters of empty track. I looked up and I thought, hang on, there's somebody on the track. The other rider is now literally 60 to 70 meters in front of me. You attacked him. I'm thinking, oh my gosh, this wasn't part of the script. <laughs> <laughs> so as I came around on, you know, lap nine into lap 10, my coach Tom is screaming, screaming, catch him. And I could just literally hear it out of my helmet, you know, catch him, catch him. So my inert voice, as you know, the chimp Mm -hmm. says, you've won. Well done. Because I'm I'm almost now behind him, 40 meters. Surviving mode kicked in. And I'll never forget, and I'll share this with the audience and with you. I'll never forget thinking to myself, just stay upright. That's all I have to do is breathe, pedal, stay upright. So lap 10 into lap 11, literally comes around the corner. The, the, the crowd obviously have just gone crazy at this point. And I could feel the rider's slipstream on my face. I was that close, you know, literally now 25, 30 meters behind him, you know. And then obviously on lap 11 into lap 12, it, it was just pushing through the pain barrier. Because remember, like I said earlier on, the feeling of lactic acid, the feeling of riding on full maximum, mm-hmm. you get used to. Yeah. Because it because it's only for a short period of time, you know? It's not forever. Yeah. But that last 100 meters was just pushing through the pain barrier to try and catch him. Pain cave. N- not to win, because mm. technically I just needed to stay upright to win. But the new race was to try and catch him. So there's the new feeling of go on, keep going, go on. So I'd gone from just being in that meditative state of, you know, doing the process to now this almost this warrior feeling of survival, Mm -hmm. you know. And then coming up to the the start finish line, because you're programmed when you cross the finish line, the gun goes off Mm. for the race to finish. And you look up at the scoreboard, you know, at the digital scoreboard. So across the line, gun goes off, looks up at the scoreboard, and there's no time. Just two letters. WR. Amazing. World record. (laughs) I was like, what? (laughs) What? So I'd literally broken the world record again by Mm -hmm. 0.011, which is literally that fast, that much at 50 kilometers an hour, you know. I cannot imagine the energy uh, starting with you and the audience and of course your coach because I, I've seen the video several times and it's, it's really inspiration that when you put all your mental physical in that occasion and that environment and what you can achieve is really amazing okay it's, it's after this it's, it's you didn't basically take it to the second phase to continue in the in the in the Olympics or Paralympics what made you decide that to carry on by bringing your story and to become inspiration to others. 
which is I really love because I looked into basically what you've done even post the, the uh, winning the gold and the mission that you are on now. What is the driver that made you, okay, let me carry on by inspiring others? Well, like I said earlier on, you know, to, to do things for yourself is easy. Mm. Okay. If somebody wants to do something, they plan, they prepare, they learn from others and they go and do it. Okay. Yeah. When you want to help other people, that's the that's where the value really comes you know in helping and sharing education information with other people and that's why now i've just qualified as a coach yeah. you know as a as a practitioner mm -hmm. you know in coaching to follow that journey to use the skills use the knowledge use the process to support other people on their journey i can't do it for them mm -hmm. i can't yeah but i can do it with them Does that make sense? It makes full you know? sense. So, so my mission is to actually support up to one million people to look good, feel great, and be happy. Because in my eyes, that's the, the trio of, of what encapsulates life. So on that point, where people can reach you now? So markcolborn.com, you know, we, we've had the website for 10 years. We've just had a full rebrand, mm -hmm. you know, when I made the decision to move to the Middle East, you know, to move to the UAE, to move to Dubai, was to, you know, bring the, bring the, I suppose the, what's the right word, the value of helping other people, mm -hmm. you know, with a new website, with a new branding, with new offerings, you know, coaching, life coaching, presenting, you know, coaching on the bike, you know, uh, I'll share this with you because when we walked into your house and you have a beautiful house here, you know, this okay. house is just is stunning. It's beautiful. And the first thing I noticed was your wonderful digital TV. Mm -hmm. I've not had a TV for about five years. <laughs> Now, some people think that's a bit weird. Okay. <laughs> But where I see value in my downtime, okay, is maybe through listening to audibles, mm -hmm. listening to podcasts like this, yeah. listening to people who've been there and bought the t-shirt, as we say. And yeah. We spoke about Mike Tyson earlier mm -hmm. on, you know, probably one of the greatest heavyweights ever, you know. And um, and he's been through, you know, a, a, an incredible journey, yeah. you know, of good, bad and ugly. Absolutely. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm aware you of know? his biography, which is also an inspiring, inspiring story because everyone has a t total different perception about him. But yeah, again, yeah. what he's been doing and what he's doing now yeah. is quite quite interesting and inspirational too. So so for me to live out my legacy, to answer your question, you know, I've already thought about the end. Okay, mm -hmm. I've already thought about the, yeah, that the time in my life where my eyes will close for good. And now I'm 52. I'm 53 now in November. I feel physically strong, emotionally strong, mentally strong, spiritually strong. Okay, I, f I feel I've ticked all those boxes, not, not through great luck, but through great health, you know, and, and I'm in control of that. Nobody else is going to do it for me. Does that make sense? Makes and sense. it goes back to the games. If I was going to be successful, it was going to be down to me. If I was going to fail, it was going to be down to me, you know. So when you take that perspective on life, everything changes. You know, going back to Dr. Steve Peters, think logically, not emotionally, mm -hmm. you know, do what you need to do to give you the great health, you know, every day, because it's a choice. It's a complete choice, Absolutely. you know, so to help other people to live out my legacy, because the one thing that I do not want when I get to the end of my life, you know, I may still have my health, touch wood, you know, in, ma in many years to come. Um, but the one thing I will not have is time so whatever i want to do i have to do it now because before i know it that time in the future will turn up it's like christmas absolutely christmas turns up every year does that make sense yeah it makes sense every 365 days it turns up you know so the end of your life is going to turn up whether you like it or not okay because in my opinion you know time doesn't stop for no man Okay, and it's the only commodity that we can never buy back. That's true. Mark, uh, I think I think this is an, an amazing end note. I think we, we, we covered and I cannot thank you enough for being uh, present here and sharing the story. 
And uh, again, uh, thank you very much for your time. Uh, I think this is it. Uh, of course, we discussed that we can the people can reach out to you on on the uh, the website, which is the Right Three Sixty Five. Well, people can obviously come to take a look at markcolborn yeah. mm -hmm. and Mark Colborn is spelled M A R K C O L B O U R N E mm -hmm. dot com. So all of the new services and products and offerings, you know, are based on the new website, which is going to be launched, you know, the first week in October mm -hmm. 2022. And it's going to be a great journey, you know, for people to take take a look, step into, you know, the life of optimum health, which is my vision, Love you it. know, to help other people done through done through the process of holistic coaching, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. of, of covering all those areas that, you know, has helped me from, you know, from when I broke my back to breaking world records and beyond, you know, as I said, in my 50s now, I still cycle 300, 350 kilometers a week, you know, <laughs> um, and, you know, I sit here today, you know, for the audience yeah, that's listening, obviously on the podcast, um, <laughs> you know, as a Paralympic gold medal um, that's in front of me here, you know, I've just opened the box just to show uh, Safwan. And, you know, e every time I open this box and I see this incredible, yeah, incredible amazing. Paralympic gold medal, I think of the people that helped me to achieve this, you know, all the way back to my school teachers, mm. my college, you know, teachers, my friends, my family, you know, my parents, then British Cycling, you know, Neil Smith, as I said, the, my first cycling coach, all of these incredible people who helped me to achieve, in my opinion, what is and still is a childhood dream, mm. you know. And I'll leave you with this, you know, one, one of the uh, questions I was asked, you know, when I finished, you know, professional cycling was the question, what would I like written on my headstone? I said, well, I'd not really thought that far ahead. But what I wanted was the words, I know I made a difference. Inspiring. That's really inspiring. Mark, again, thank you very much. I really appreciate that. My pleasure. And uh, thank you very much for listening. And I would love to, to hear the feedback, the thoughts, how to improve on this podcast. But again, I cannot thank you enough. And uh, definitely we're going to catch up and all the best. With the, with the project, I love it. And uh, I'm not sure if I'm gonna join the cycling, but I wanna give it a shot. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Mark, we'll catch up for soon. My pleasure, thank you very much. And everybody listening and watching all around the world, thank you for joining, thank you for pressing play, and good luck and take care. Thank you.